It didn't take me a long time to realize I wasn't cis. I'm not very private about my gender presentation and identity. I'm only out as non-binary because you can't really deny the existence of something that sits in front of you. Every aspect of my being is undeniably gender neutral, with a little more sway to masculinity. And I like it that way. In preschool, being a girl wasn't a desirable thing to be for me. Sure, I liked the dresses. I liked being called cute or smart. I liked when people liked me, and for some reason that all came with the assumption that I was a girl, or was okay with being a girl. But it did come with its own downfalls. <laughs> to be a girl, I couldn't rough house with boys. I couldn't pick fights for my sister's honor and dignity. I couldn't climb high places or do something as undignified as lie down on the cement to look at the sky. Now, with the proper words to describe my experiences, I realize that's what they call social dysphoria. I have freedom as a guy that I couldn't as a girl. I was raised to be a people pleaser even to the people I didn't like, something no one would have forced me to do as a guy. But where do you draw the line between social and gender dysphoria? What's the difference between feeling like people expect you to be different because of what they perceive you and feeling like you have to be different because of the way people perceive you? I know a bunch of media that has helped me understand that. In 2016, while I was undergoing a wholly different personal ordeal, I decided to confront my different experiences with gender and sexuality. I looked up everything I could, read novels, watched coming out videos, and read up on history. I'm not kidding when I say that our generation has an abundance of research that our predecessors accumulated, and I am grateful for it. It's why I'm a big advocate of looking for things that aren't catered to the mainstream. Because the mainstream is not where our kin are. Corporations are not our friends. You will not find yourself in filling their wallets. There are more of us out there producing content under the radar, and with the internet's help, finding them isn't as hard a task as it was decades prior. Hell, that's how I stumble on this. Horomusuko, translated to English as Wandering Sun, is a work by Shimura Takako, serialized from December 2002 until August 2013. It was adapted to screen by AIC Classic, directed by Aoki A and was released between January and March 2011. Horomusuko itself is a tangle of emotions. Nitori Shuichi is trying to untangle hers about her gender while navigating through elementary school and her relationship with her friends, as well as her feelings for boys around her age and close friend Takatsuki Yoshino. It also veers into junior high as the story progresses. I know the anime itself focuses on the junior high aspect. I don't know why. Um, maybe it's because it's really hard to hire genuine um, voice actors for children. <laughs> I don't know. It's a mess. Not narratively, no. The story itself makes a lot of sense, actually. It's a coming-of-age story where our heroine has to grapple with her wants and needs, her relationships, and the expectations that come with them. But it is certainly a mess, because as life would have it, prioritizing one or the other always ends up with something suffering for it. Life and time is not and will never be linear. It's a series of moments where a decision leads to an outcome and an event happens regardless of your readiness to accept it. Horomusuko masterfully uses this aspect without ever feeling like it's going nowhere. It gives its audience a reasonable amount of hope and dread, as life always does. Above all, Shu's struggle with gender in and out of the closet is one of the driving forces of the story, something that weaves itself perfectly into every aspect. In reality, Horomusuko is one of the only stories I've read that has managed to make gender feel more integral to the story than Shu's relationship with the people he likes. There are some discourses within the community regarding the amount of works with coming out narratives and struggling with anti-queer rhetoric, especially with slice-of-life works. Take, for example, the negative reception for works like Love, Simon, and Heartstopper. Though these stories deal more with sexual orientation rather than they do gender identity, the reception towards somewhat mainstream works that have plot points like being accepted by cishet society is startlingly negative with 
I can't call them veterans, but they're not newcomers, so let's call them novices within queer spaces. A lot of queer folk are tired of having to conform to cishet society, and I agree. So am I. <laughs> cishet society comes with the burdens of expectations and a need to explain so many things that cishets with their tiny baby brains will never understand. Honestly, even just in fan fiction, I like it when a society is homo because if I get to experience a fantasy, why can't I experience it like cishet people do? Where the only thing characters need to worry about are class and potentially race. The, the bar is so low. <laughs> anyway. So yeah, I can understand why there aren't a lot of feel-good or even authentic stories that have to deal with coming out or staying in the closet narratives because they put a significant damper in the feel-goodiness of a story just by being included at all. But as I've learned through sitting through a bunch of things that Gab likes and discussing them at length on a monthly basis, <laughs> sincerity and authenticity does not belie a positive set of topics or themes. Sincerity and authenticity make sure you confront heavy themes with as much hope as possible. And the Horobos Code does just that. Shu's youth and genuine love for an honest life makes it almost easy to do that. She faces her future with the hopes of finding happiness in it, both in herself and the people she loves. And despite all the bullshit life throws at her, she is still so full of love for it, determined to get to live out her life as genuinely as she can despite her circumstances. Hell, in spite of it, even, she wants to be able to live long enough to be herself. And I think maybe as queer people, we've forgotten what that feels like, or decide not to think about it. I'm not trying to generalize and psychoanalyze a group of people, but really, you know, as what can only be described as a young adult, I'm admittedly still a little naive, a little too childish. <laughs> At 22, I don't feel a day over 16, and as a 15-year-old, finding this story for the first time, I never felt a day younger. As a queer person, I was forced to grow up faster, but I am still perceived as younger still. I am not in the closet like Takatsuki and Shu were. I don't choose to stay there for fear of being rejected or alienated. I have found my people and I am happy with them. But queer time, according to Jack Halberstam, is different from the time cishets are more accustomed to. And what he means by this, of course, are the set life events sociologist Pam Aronson defined most adults tend to go through. People have five set life events they're expected to have finished around a certain age in their adulthood. Finishing their education, joining the labor force, getting married, and starting a family. And though these are inherently American life events, they're still very much instilled in a lot of Asian society, with a passionate fervor only Asian traditionalists would be proud of. You know, because of colonialism. Sarah Jaff, Jaff, author of this article that I very much recommend reading, has based her understanding of what sociologists have found within the years. That queer children are seen as ghosts, as though their identities are and will never be acknowledged within their youth. Because sexuality is only determined through sexual experiences and the determined lack thereof. And gender identity can only be determined through life experience. Something children don't lack, but definitely don't have an abundance of. And it's this purgatorial state that makes queer children feel like they're growing outside of a culture. That puts them in stasis until they're allowed to be able to explore these avenues. Though I could say with conviction that it I experienced social dysphoria as a child, I can only determine it looking back. How much I hated being restricted to being a girl, how much I didn't want to be a girl. And though I felt very strongly as a child, you can still say that it could have just been my general hatred for being subjected to inherent misogyny of modern day society. And growing up, I've encountered worse feelings and even gender dysphoria, which cemented these feelings to, oh wow, I am definitely not cis. <laughs> because life has a funny way of making you confront things in yourself you'd either rather ignore or avoid. Though children like Shu and Takatsuki still have a long way to go before they finally settle into the fluidity of identity and preference, they have to get there before they actually determine it. That's where we root for them. 
<laughs> as the audience that, that they still find the silver lining so that they actually become the true self they wish for. And that's why it makes so much sense that Hora Musuko's adaptation is colored in watercolor, set to melancholic music. There's a nostalgic sense to it, as if looking through and remembering hazy and bittersweet memories with an overwhelming sense of something. Triumph, maybe? Conviction? That this day, out of the many Shu and Takatsuki have had throughout their lives, was a turning point for them. And they are, arguably. Experiencing Horo Musuko in its entirety feels like watching someone's life unfold from mystery to perfect clarity. It points at what it wants you to see and tells you, see, Shu always wanted to be a girl like Yoshino was never going to be. It's definitive yet loose in it telling you this because you can only determine things like this upon looking back. And that's not to say children cannot actually say these things for certain. For kids like Shu and Takatsuki, sometimes gender identity is just a fact. Though marred with experiences of everyday society somewhat wavering in its conviction, it is undeniably true that Shu hates being a boy, and experiencing life as a boy makes her feel wrong, and that Takatsuki would rather be a boy than experience life as a girl. These feelings aren't a phase, <laughs> and the story doesn't look down on them doesn't make you think that they are. They are trans. And though every second spent hiding it feels like forever, all they need is just a little bit more time to grow, to gain more understanding of the people around them, how to behave outwardly, not as if they're playing the roles that they want for a culture festival, but as themselves. There's some stuff I actually didn't get to put in here. I brought up um, a little bit earlier something about how um, a lot of queer people don't really like seeing um, anti-queer rhetoric in fiction, which sometimes it gets a little tiring to have to experience that even in fiction, you know? I get it. I understand. And the fact of the matter is these little quirks of like only wanting to see the content and not the consequences of having these things play out as they would in real life is that they only happen in queer romances and that's the thing that i noticed is that and i didn't actually get to point out here because i admittedly i don't really look for gender identity stories myself or it's not that I try not to it's just that I just don't know where to start looking for it that and I and just like everyone else like we all experience gender identity and like gender itself very differently from each other and though it's fun to see you know fictional interpretations of it like little twists and stuff we can never really agree <laughs> with at least one version of this story there's only so many ways this could go and you know i think what really refreshed me about watching horo musuko was that they didn't really have these words you know they didn't have the words trans or not binary or they're kids and they don't <laughs> they don't have the set labels and it's just very refreshing to me specifically because this was set around the same time that i was growing up not really grappling with my own gender identity but like there's just a sense of nostalgia to it that even though i never read or watch it growing watched it growing up it just felt like something i could connect to because i didn't have those words either and i think that's like that's something a lot of younger generations of queer people kind of don't understand is that because we live basically off the internet now <laughs> not a lot of people actually have access to those labels that even though the internet is a necessity for us these days, we didn't always have that and not a lot of us still do, if that makes sense. But yeah, <laughs> happy Pride Month, everyone. Um, as always, if you want to support me, my Kofi is in the description. Um, we have a Discord if you want to join that. That's where I'll be posting my updates, bloopers. 
behind the scenes screenshots of my script <laughs> as I'm making them and more if you guys want anything else oh yeah I mentioned that I do talks with Gab once a month yeah we do have a podcast <laughs> um, I think since I'm uploading this in June um, the next one is gonna be my episode yeah the next one's gonna be Killing Eve I don't know if this will come out first before the Bill and Ted episode <laughs> That's about to be an hour long, but um, yeah, uh, if you guys want to listen to the podcast, I'll probably put a link down below too. Anyway, as always, stay safe. Bye!